Det som står för CCM-organisationen av att vi faktiskt har en scen specifikt tillägnad konstformen tecknade serier, vilket vi är väldigt stolta. Vi är också väldigt stolta över att ha Don Rosa här på scen. Uh, vi kommer idag ha en ganska speciellt samtal. Vi som satt här längst fram hörde hur vi diskuterade vad vi ska göra. Vi har inte bestämt. Det här blir free fall. Det kan bli precis så konstigt som helst. Uh, men viktigast att säga är att det här kommer att ske på engelska. Jag kan inte prata svenska med Don Rosa. Jag kan inte hålla på att översätta hela tiden. Så att diskussionen blir på engelska och jag hoppas att om det är någon som inte är jättebra på engelska här eller uh, de yngre läsare att någon hjälper till lite grann. Så. Det fungerar också så här, vi kommer att titta på en specifik serie, vi kommer gå igenom den sida för sida, så långt vi hinner. Och försöka, som det engelska uttrycket är, plocka Doms hjärna på vad han gjorde och vad han tänkte så idag. Han påstår att han tänkte så mycket, det tror jag att han gjorde. Det finns också möjlighet för er att hoppa in och säga, hallå, hallå, varför frågar du inte om det här om den här sidan? Vi kommer att börja från sida ett och gå framåt. Och har ni en fråga, ni tycker, nej nu sprang ni lite förbi, förbi det här lite fort, så finns det mikrofoner på båda sidor så kan man räcka upp handen och säga ursäkta, jag undrar det här så försöker vi se till att alla var med och ställa en fråga Är ni med? All right, so that was my introduction that was me saying bad things about you uh, in Swedish not really, but still um, We actually, let's start with, with the, with the you know, uh, average journalist question How are you? Uh, I'm fine. I think uh, we usually talk about my eyesight uh, every, yep. every year. And, uh, Let's do that. Uh, well, I think since I was here last time, uh, I had four operations in my good eye. Which, Whoa! Which, which is, uh, so finally, both images that I see through my eyes, uh, I think I talked about previously, one was very, very small because of the thick eyeglasses, but the eye that I had had the trouble in, and they had uh, put a replacement eye lens in, Uh, image was normal size, so but now I've had the same operation in this eye, so things are both the same size, so I can see pretty well now. This this eye is still tilted and warped, but that's negligible. I don't really notice that. So now everything is the same size again on both sides. So it used to be when I would be in a, if I was sitting and watching television or reading a book, my brain could have put the two images together. But when I was in a room like this, the people are moving and there's lots. Of thousands of different things to see, I was like cross-eyed, I was like double vision, but now it's fine. Perfect. So that's finally a nice report on the eyesight. So. That's a lot better than, uh, I remember us sitting down on stage in Copenhagen years ago, when you had just had had your first operation, right. and then you got the, the permission to go via an airplane, by days the, before the, the flight. Because, uh, and we won't get into that detail, well, uh, anyway. but uh, when there's a detached retina, the way they force the retina back into place is to drain the your eyeball, or my eyeball in this case, and put a gas bubble in the eye, and the gas bubble pushes the retina back into place like a split on a, a broken bone. But then, since the bubble is going up, I had to lean forward for two months. So, uh, but the thing is, when there's a gas bubble in your eye, they tell me that they I can't do any plane cramp. They don't explain why. I kind of figure it would just be unpleasant for the person sitting next to me if my eye explodes. Oh, boom. <laughs> uh, So, uh, but it, uh, the, uh, the bubble slowly disappears uh, as the natural fluids refill your eye, and it happened just a week before uh, the, the, the uh, show in Copenhagen. Now, earlier this year, uh, well, I had a, a retinal detachment in the same eye again, whoa, uh, last fall, last uh, uh, November, December, last winter, and... Uh, But this time you no, might have known what to do because you didn't the first time. Okay. You uh, waited too right. long to go to the doctor. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that. Oh, well. It turns out that... Uh, We're they, not going to talk all day about your eyes. That's <laughs> right. But anyway, I, I had it again a week after I got back, or less than a week after I got back to France in January. And that was very fortunate because if it had happened when I was in France, I'd had to stay in France for two months or taking a boat back. So Would that anyway. have been so bad? Would that have been so bad? Stay for, for yeah. a couple of months in I, France? I miss my uh, my dogs and yeah. my wife also. <laughs> in that order. <laughs> you know this is being recorded, right? <laughs> oh well. Well, we're going to stop there, I think. Okay. Um, the idea I had to 
Jay, I mean, we've been on stage a lot of times. And usually we do the same routine. We talk about your career, we talk about uh, your working process, and then you draw Scrooge on stage. Yeah. And, and that's it. And we've done that all over the world, and we thought, we'd do, I thought, we're going to do something different today. Um, I thought we would look more specifically into one comic that you've done. And looking at uh, everything you've done, I chose Guardians of the Lost Library, Bibliotheca Spokuidar for Svenska. And uh, you actually questioned me yesterday, say, why did you choose that? And uh, the immediate answer is, is that it's, it's one of my favorite stories that you've ever done. Well, I, I was guessing. I was just wondering what your reaction or your answer would be. Because mm -hmm. when I did this story, well, I should first give the background of the story. This was done uh, for Norway. They're the only country, the Egmont country, that the editor would have requests. And this was done for, uh, he wanted a story to go along for the, with the Norwegian celebration of the year of the book, they called it. So I was supposed to do a story all about the importance of books, which is something I'm, I'm a book collector, not just a comic book collector, but I'm a collector of old books. So I was well interested in that idea. So this was done for that, that Norwegian celebration. Uh, but when I was done with this story, I did a lot of research and I was fascinated by it, but I thought I, was, I thought it was interesting, but I thought it was a really boring story. It was just like a travelogue. They try to go from here to here and here. Uh, but as uh, in the years since then, people have said, uh, a lot of people have said it's their favorite story that I've done. Some other people have said it's their favorite Dutch story. And there have been other people who said it was their favorite comic book story. They never read it, which I think is kind of crazy, but there's apparently something in here that people really like. So uh, that's why I'd, I'd like to try to. The problem is, you can see on the, the coat here, I wrote this story sometime in early 1992. So uh, I really don't remember a single thing about it, but I'll, yeah, make, I'll you, make up some things. You gave me a great quote when we were emailing about this. Uh, you said, now I begin to know what Barks must have felt like when people started interviewing him in the 70s oh. about work he did 75 years earlier. In other words, I don't really recall what I was thinking when I wrote the Guardian story, and I don't recall all the research I did. So that's a good start for this, this discussion, I think. But I've, I've looked through here, uh, I came in and did my homework uh, about an hour ago, and as I look through here, I can think of things to say about every page. It's not necessarily the, uh, the research I did, because I really don't remember. Uh, but I can see the mistakes that I made, and the, the story had to be rearranged at some point, so we could talk about that. Uh, but, but as far as just beginning the research I do on any of the stories where I did research, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting paid to do stories that are based in reality. That's just something I enjoy because I'm a history buff and a book buff. So I have always known when I do a story just like this one, when I want to base the, the uh, adventures of talking ducks, of course I see them as human beings, but everybody else must see them as talking ducks, I'm basing it in reality. So I used to always tell myself, well, I've got two weeks. I'll allow two weeks for research. And that's time I know I'm not getting paid for. It. I'm just doing that for my own amusement. But after that, I just hope that I've stumbled across all the important facts that I need to do an interesting story because I just can't waste more time. Just amusing myself, I've got to earn some money with it. Uh, but uh, the other thing with doing research is I'll just, uh, still books were better than the internet because I, I could have them several open at the same time and, and uh, make notes. I could access them actually faster, uh, and the, the images faster, but uh, I would just fill a notebook with extraneous facts, just anything that sounded interesting. But uh, when I finally sat down to see which of these facts I could kind of link together, I'd only use about a tenth of them. So there's a whole lot more research goes into this than, uh, than you can imagine. Uh, well, I find it interesting when you print this, you know, the sort of the end-all printing of, of the, the Don Rosa stories, yeah. in that you got uh, annotations, but the annotations are Paul Bart's reference, Don Rosa reference, and comics reference. There are no reference to the real world. And you, you've obviously, you've used a lot of real-world facts for this story. Yeah. So is it that mentioned in... Uh, there are some mentions, but, but, but not an annotation in the way that you do for, yeah. or someone did for, for the, for the Barks and Rosa uh, references, which I find interesting in itself. Anyway, um, 
You say you allocate two weeks. Did you do that for this story as well? Because this is long, a long story and it's filled with facts. Yeah. Was that still that's just two weeks? That's all I could, I could waste. All the time I could waste. Mm -hmm. Like I said, take, making it fun for myself. So. Then, then I think you were, you were a fast reader. Because you crammed in a lot of facts into the story. And, and you got them in, a, in an but, order that makes sense. But the other thing, and this isn't the best example of that, but when I would uh, research the facts of actual history, I would have lists of them. I would find ways to put them together, or they would fit together so easily on their own that I was astounded. First of all, the writing the story seemed simple. Mm. It was right there in the books. It just, just took very little effort to link different facts together to make a really fascinating story. I, I didn't think this one was very fascinating, but some of the others I thought were kind of interesting. And I was amazed that somebody hadn't written a book or made a movie about these same facts. And, uh, and I, I always say it sounds like I'm being uh, some, uh, some teacher who's telling kids, you know, history is very fascinating. It really is. The history you're taught in schools is dates and dates of uh, treaties and wars and when this happened, this. And it is very boring because you have to get all the important facts when you're studying in school. But when you, and history, uh, uh, people who've actually studied history in college know this, when you really get into the tiny details, it's really interesting that it's all driven, it's, it's like movies or TV shows. It's all, history is not driven by the facts that you see in these books. It's driven by these personalities, these people and these adventures they want to have. Are the greed they have? They they want to go explore new lands for money, not for history. They they want money, and it's it's the best story like that that I ever did was. Uh, you can tell that we're not going to get to page twenty eight, right? Yeah. All right. No, 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 no. no keep talking. Yeah. I'm just. Okay. Kidding. No, I'm just uh, just in briefly. Uh, I did one called the uh, the Last Lord of El Dorado, which was just fascinating, and every word in that was uh, about the history of the search for the El Dorado and the. Uh, uh, and the fact that somebody, one of uh, Pizarro's men or somebody had actually discovered it and kept it secret for uh, a century. Was, but anyway, let's uh, start on this. Well, this one. my first question really, when, when, when we're supposed to be at page one. We are right now. What? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We're gonna get to that. Um, That's not you, the image you, I see. No, no, no. This is the actually this is the original uh, publication from the uh, Don, Swedish Donald Duck right, well, magazine. I thought it was interesting to have that there to talk about that because it looks different, of course. In this the, is the corrected version. Well, this is the end. version. Yeah. I had no control over that version. Yeah. This I finally insisted that they do it right. We're gonna get to that. All right. Uh, first, I'd like you to talk about because. You talked earlier on the way you write uh, a story in that you start at the end oh, yeah. and work yourself backwards until about the middle and then you start again at the start and go to the middle again. That's right. Did you do the same way with this story? I did that with every single story I ever yeah. did, especially the long one. So this yeah. is one of the longest. Yeah. And if you want me to explain that again, it's actually kind of self-evident. Uh, the most important part of the story is the ending. Mm -hmm. And when I've got a story in mind, I know the ending. Otherwise, there's no reason to write the story. If I don't have a good ending, there's no reason to even start. So if I know the last panel, well, then I know the second to the last panel. This is gonna, I've, I've said this before, and I'm sure it sounds phony, but it's absolutely true. And I, I've got little uh, thumbnail sketches that I'm, I, uh, like it's the, uh, I work on a piece of paper just about, not even this big, and I'm just a little thumbnail sketch of what's happening in each panel, just, just enough to know so I can remember it. So if I know the last panel, I know the second to the last, and if I know that one, I know what has to happen in the third to the last, and I'll literally work back panel by panel for uh, seven or eight pages, and then I know the second most important part of the story is the beginning. And the mistake probably made, I assume, by a lot of the stories that are written more for children in these comics is the first panel will open up, they're already on a treasure hunt. Well, who cares? We, we don't know what the treasure we, we did not get interested in the treasure. So a story has to open up like, like this one does, but nobody knows what the story is going to be about. Nobody's interested in looking for the lost, in this, in this case, the lost uh, library of Alexandria. So we get interested in the search as the characters get interested in the search. So in other words, like I, it's just the opposite. I know how the story's gonna open, so I'll know the next panel and the, just the normal progression. 
And then the thing is, you have the, I've got the ending of the story and the beginning of the story. And all I need is the middle of the story, which is going to be humor and action. So, but if it's like uh, one action sequence, more or less, or one humor, one uh, joke uh, sequence, it's not, a, it's not important. That's the problem with American action movies now. They think the action sequence is the most important. And it's, it's, you've got a little tiny, instead of a huge opening sequence and a, a huge closing logical sequence and a small action scene in the center, now you've got uh, an illogical, meaningless opening and a typically illogical ending and a giant action sequence that gets boring because you don't you, about 15 minutes into it, you give up, you don't care. So that's uh, so, so. I just kind of dovetail the uh, the ending of my story to the beginning of the story, and uh, it seemed to work out. Mm -hmm. But the length of the story, because it is one of your longer stories. Yeah. Did you get uh, because this was commissioned by the Norwegian? In these days, I never had any choice. They would tell me they need a 24, usually a 24 page story, mm -hmm. which even then was longer than they let anybody else. Uh, and these stories all had to be broken up into three pieces. This story uh, where you see these large panels, uh, not that one, but, uh, well anyway, these had to be broken up in three pieces, uh, which was not very comfortable, but I'd have to do that. But yeah, it's uh, that's one way this is not art. It, uh, I could not make the page of the story five or six pages longer if I needed it. I just had to, that's why most of these comics, uh, the other comics of the weekly had average of seven panels per page. In mine, in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four. I think I averaged it out to ten panels per page in one mine because I couldn't chart my story. I just keep squeezing it together. But you got a uh, commission for a 28-page story. Was that it? Yeah, they told me. I tell them the story, the idea I had. They said, okay, it's going to be 24 pages long. How do they know how many pages it's going to be? They have <laughs> the story hadn't been written yet, and they already know how long it's going to be. So. But so I had to. Uh, I have 60 page ideas and have to put it into 24 pages. Because this feels like uh, a story that would fit into a European album, which is 50, 60 pages, yeah. not 28. So I can see that you try to sort of cram as much information as possible into it. That's right. But still, rereading it now, and it feels very mathematical in the way you tell the story. There are, there are certain places they need to visit. Every every place gets a certain amount of pages. You, yeah. you reduce the amount of books uh, at a certain pace. Yeah. And it sort of feels that you had a bigger idea of all 28 pages before you started drawing them. And that you didn't just draw, you know, from back to, to start from well, start to When finish. I start actually drawing what you see here, uh, yeah, I knew exactly what was going to happen in every panel. Yeah. Those thumbnail sketches, those were not things I could uh, later ink. That was just scribbles. Because then after that, I would write out the dialogue carefully in notebooks. And I wouldn't have to put any, like a normal comic book writer would not, uh, they have to put descriptions of the panel and description of the artwork for the artist. I didn't have to do that because I was the artist. It made it real simple. I already knew what I was going to draw. And, uh, and then the next thing I would do, if you want to get uh, into that subject, oh, yeah. is I would... Uh, get sheets of, what do we call it now? Uh, I, in those days I called it typewriter paper, but nobody knows what a typewriter is anymore, so now we call it copy paper, I guess. Uh, and I would do like the simulated comic book page uh, for the editor, so he could see what the story was. I'd do a, a, a more finished drawing of the characters and expressions, and then I'd letter in the dialogue. And that's what the editor would see. And then I was also planning out the panels that I would later draw. Uh, so that would take a few weeks, and then I would, uh, then I would actually do the actual drawing, which means I'd start from page one, panel one, and pencil it, and go all the way to the last, in this case, what, 24 some pages, uh, and then I'd go back and ink it. But, uh, but if you want to discuss this, uh, this yeah, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. But we're not going to get through all 28 pages. That's right. fine. Um, I still, I think you, you went a bit fast in, in that story because. I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by the way you, you tell the story from the back to the front and from yeah. the front to the back. Uh, when you do that, do you end up with, with a perfect meeting in the middle or do you need to rearrange to get... Because I, I still think this is perfectly 
uh, paced well, as a story, and it doesn't feel like you invented panel by panel to get that. Or was that because for, from doing so many stories well, that you knew what you could cram into 28 pages? I can't answer that. I'm just <laughs> sorry. The people ask me how you got things to work out. I don't know. It just turned out that way. They say, how do you get the pacing? This used to worry me. They said, they like my stories because the pacing is just right. And the I way that things progress. And I, I think, well, I wasn't thinking about any of this. I just, I just dumped it out on the paper. So it must have been purely by accident. And I'll never be able to do it again. And I'm ruined. <laughs> but it was just some natural. I've seen enough movies and I've watched enough or read enough comic books, watched enough TV shows, and it just, when I put it down, that's the way it comes out. So that's why uh, people sometimes ask for advice about how to do this. I don't have any advice. I don't know how I do it myself. I don't, I think you, don't, you, you teach writing and uh, yeah, the, I do. They, I say, ask uh, Frederick. He can maybe explain the process. I just let it kind of, just kind of flow out. I can explain the process, but I can't do it. Do it. So well, that's, that's the that's big difference. But if you're talking about how things, you think things are, uh, laid out exactly right. If we eventually get into looking at some of these pages, I can remember a sequence in here where I made a huge mistake and I had to actually rearrange and draw new panels to make the story work. Yeah, we're going to get to that, All I right. think. Um, so let's look at the pages. Let's start there. Um, first thing that, that strikes you when you look at page one uh, is the, the big first panel. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking, I mean, when you read Donald Duck stories, that's sort of taken for granted. It's, it's supposed to look like that. It's yeah. supposed to be, be this big panel. Oh. Um, yeah. And you do that all the time. I, is that because, A, Marx did that? Two, you like the way it looks? Three, uh, Egmont told you to? Or do you even remember? Uh, well, first of all, I'm working in half pages. I don't work on one sheet of paper. I work on two sheets because they're so large that I... I wouldn't be able to reach the top panel if it was all one sheet. So, uh, but don't all comic books uh, start out with a big, we call it a splash panel? No, not really. But you, as to what, uh, why the size was always a half a page, well, I couldn't make it a third of a page because then I wouldn't have anything to do with the bottom piece of that paper. Every single comic page I've ever done splits right down the center because that's where the paper is kind of cut in it. Have you ever had, had the urge to do a complete full page splash page? No, if you can't uh, if you can't fit fit it in a half a page, it's, it's not going to fit in a full page. It's I know that now comic books stories are told with just full page scenes. Mm -hmm. That's not necessary. So. Yeah, especially if you if you're trying to cram a story that should be 50 pages into 28. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but all I know is, uh, what I always think about is the half-page panel in Karl Marx's Only a Poor Old Man, which is the first Uncle Scrooge story he ever did. The, the half-page panel with the dam breaking and the coins pushing down uh, through the split tempers. That's the greatest panel of comic art that's ever been created. And if he, could do he did that in a half a page. So that's all you need to do great comic art. So. I did only one full-page panel was the last panel of The Life of Scrooge. When, uh, but there's actually lots of panels, I guess, because Scrooge was sitting oh, yeah. in the money yeah. bin yeah. thinking of his True. whole life. And, uh, but anyway, the, the panel we're seeing here is not the panel True. that's up there. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, uh, well, that, that it, when it was published in, in all countries except America, it didn't look the way you wanted the first time around, right? Well, in this instance, I knew it wouldn't because in that uh, circle up there, where, what is that? It's that's this, not the uh, story title. Yeah, it says, it says the museum. Uh, the Junior Woodchuck World Museum. Yeah, well, that's obviously not lettering that would be on a building, but I had no control over that. But in the comic book area, or the uh, reprint, that's what it would look like in the American edition. That's the Junior Woodchuck, Karl Marx's Junior Woodchuck symbol. It's a JWW, Junior Woodchucks of the World, which had something to do with the, the conclusion of the story, which was a conclusion that you didn't get any place except in America. Um, we could go to the half page panel and um, we could go to page two here. All right. Uh, because this is even worse, I think. Yeah. This is the, a blank, again. the blank circle on the yeah. cover is not what you're supposed to see. You're supposed to see a very faint junior woodchuck image, but it's actually not the junior woodchuck image. I guess this is a spoiler. Uh, hopefully these people have read this story. Hang on, hang on. How many have read this story already? There you go. Not a problem. 
Oh, keep, keep, keep talking. And that's the reason why the book cover is detached, because it's actually supposed to be like that. The image of the Guardians of the Lost Library. But of course, that joke, for the, the kids that read the weekly, wouldn't have made sense, so they, that was deleted. And but, but you knew this when you I drew the story. Yeah, but I know when it's a good story, and I'm working. I'm doing these stories for myself. And so I wanted that to be part of the story for myself. And what Egmont was going to do with it, I, I didn't know. But, uh, I, but I'm sitting in America, and I'm an American, and I grew up with Karl Marx's original stories. I can only do a story for myself. But, uh, I knew the story would make a certain amount of sense without that. That's just a little twist. That's not the real ending of the story. That was what I was going to ask you, because when I read the story, um, you can read it without that symbol. It, yeah. it does actually work as a story, but it adds quite a lot so, if, if it's right. in, so included. So I knew the, the story would work, but I knew that was a great twist. And I knew someday, uh, well, I was hoping someday they would publish it in a book like this and they'd add that back into it for the, the older readers. And, uh, and in this volume, you got, you got your wish. So. Yeah. Was, was it included in the Hall of Fame? Uh, like this? Yeah. I, I think it probably was, with the correction. I can't remember. The next thing I can talk about is uh, the fourth page. All right. Can they access yeah. things that quickly? Yep. Yep. Not that a problem. Quick. When I was looking through this this morning for homework, I remember that the top panel, uh, the Library of Alexandria, supposedly as it was, I got that uh, from watching a, uh, a television series that was current at the time, a TV documentary called Cosmos. Carl Sagan. Oh yeah. And they did a, an episode about the Library of Alexandria, and that's what it looked like. So that's that was good enough for me. To, uh, that's a great TV series. Oh yes. Uh, uh, that's one thing I, I was wondering. Here you got a very obvious Karl Marx reference. In, oh, in, in, in should be obvious. All general, you have yeah. everything, but General, but general Snazzy. Snazzy, yeah. Uh, I love General Snazzy. So. Snuff. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I was wondering, and you, you say you can't remember, so you might not be able to answer this, but when you drew this. Uh, do you have the Kohlberg stories so well ingrained that you can draw General Snazzy, or do you need to look at his originals? I, uh, I could do it pretty good, but it has to be perfect. So, I, I've so got you're, my, you're looking my, at Kohlberg stories while you're My drawing. Mark's library is always, I reach up and get a copy and I draw him just the way he should be drawn, but it's drawn in my style, of course. I can only draw in my own style. But I wanted to make sure it looked like Karl Marx's General Snazzy. Because that was a. I was reading General Snazzy. There was only, what, three or four General Snazzy uses back in the. Uh, back when I was a kid, seven or eight years old. So. That was but he like was a very dear character to me, a dog character. I knew General Snazzy. I didn't know. Uh, Boulevard. I didn't know Boulevard. Because uh, Marx used him in the 40s. And my sister's collection started in 1950. So I didn't know anything about Bolivar, but I knew General Snazzy, and I love dogs, so that's... Otherwise, I tried to put Bolivar in a story once, but in order to do that, uh, I, since he had never appeared in one of my stories, I wanted to do an origin of Bolivar, and that was again going to be in that same story I mentioned earlier, the uh, El Dorado, because I figured they would get Bolivar from uh, down where uh, Simon Bolivar was, uh, was a hero down in South America. But the editors said, I can't do an origin for a character that everybody knows has been around for years. So, but I really miss using the dog character in the Donald Duck comics. But this is one chance. Well, I like the, the image of you drawing and having all the, the Colbar's library just in front of you. Oh, they're right. I like the image of that. Within an image. Yeah. Right next to me. Yeah. Anytime I'd, uh, I'd always have a book open to make sure I was... Because I was doing my stories for myself and other Karl Marx fans. I wasn't doing it for the, the problem with Egmont's system, well not Egmont's, but the Disney comic system, where I don't never make a penny for the popularity of my stories. They collect all the money and Disney collects all the money for the popularity of my stories. Their problem with that, but then the thing that released me is that I didn't care how popular my stories were. That was their worry. So I just did stories that I thought I'd like to read. And hopefully some other Karl Marx fans or somebody else would hope. But if they did, Obvi obviously a lot of people didn't. But <clears throat> sorry about that. But so that in a way I was glad that uh, I tried to tell myself I was glad I wasn't getting a, a penny of the share of the profits. I didn't care how popular the stories were, so I, I wouldn't have to try to worry about well if I do a story about uh, laptop computers or soccer or uh, etc. to make it more popular with more readers. I'd have worried about that. 
I hope I wouldn't, but, but I didn't have to work because it didn't matter who, if anybody liked the stories or not. No, we if you, the, the, I got something, uh, something I copied also on the next page. All right, so yeah. go to page five. Yeah. Down there. Uh, again, another image of the Library of Alexandria, and unless I'm mistaken, I got that out of an asterisk. <laughs> when uh, Asterix was the very good library way, of Alexandria. To start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought both of those were, I try to steal from only the best. Mm -hmm. So I think if you look at uh, some Asterix album, that's, that's the library of Alexandria. I was wondering about uh, the depiction of Abdominal here. Uh, I read a few reviews of, of this they did, story. They didn't like that. No, several persons uh, argued that you misused the character of Donald in the story. I'm using him for a specific reason in this yep. story. He's, he's a representative of all the, the typical American who all he knows about life is television. Or a typical American who uh, all he knows about Europe is uh, Disney World. You know, a typical American nowadays would rather, rather than see Norway, he'd rather see Epcot Center, Norway. That's to, to them, that's easier and simpler and more understandable and more fattening than actually going to Norway. But uh, so Donald here is serving a purpose, and I don't regret it at all. He's definitely serving the purpose of somebody who doesn't understand or appreciate books, and everything he knows is just the violent, simple minded action on the TV set. So I actually just realized when I reread it that. I mean, you set all your stories in the 50s. Right. So he's actually looking at 50s TV shows yeah. and, yeah. and not reruns of these 50s TV yeah, shows, right. but he's, he's looking at them at, at the time. The first run. Yeah. yeah. I think it works. And I, each I, one I, of these, as I recall, was a specific type of TV. One time it's mm -hmm. a science fiction show, yeah. one time it's a, a Western, I think. One time it's a detective show or something. Well, but I can't really see the... Well, I can understand the critique, uh, but I can also see that... The, the role fits Donald very well. I thought so, it was perfect. So it's, I don't oh, think I it's just, a problem. I'm not sorry, I, you know, I, uh, I'm sorry if somebody doesn't like one of my stories, but that's the way it is. Yep. You, can't, you can't please everybody. Somebody was asking me last night at dinner, what's the thing that I, most important thing I learned while I was doing comics? And I said, well, I don't think I ever really learned anything. But, uh, oh, but it, then it struck me, the one thing I learned while I was doing comics is that every story I did would be one person's very favorite story they've ever read, and it'll be another person's least favorite, you'll think it's just a total waste of time, and everybody else is spread somewhere in between. So I just learned you can't please everybody, uh, that's as, as the saying goes. And again, like I was saying before, so all I tried to do was please myself. I didn't care what other people thought, I hope they'd like it, but... The important thing was that I'd be happy with it, and then I would, that's why you see so much work here. I was pouring my passion into it. I was just trying to entertain myself, and hopefully somebody else would like it. Can we go to, let's see, I think it's page seven, I think. We go two pages, four. Yeah, there you go. This is, this is just, it's that page. Yeah. You got that. This is, for me, sort of a normal page. It hasn't got a splash panel or something like that. Could you just tell me how you paced this, how, how you thought when you drew that? Do you remember? No. No. <laughs> That's a good answer. I just knew what had to happen and I just... Uh... Okay, another thing that uh, you hear that you probably teach and you're, I don't want to say I disagree with it, but uh, some people do. have comic books as artwork and they say, oh, the art director said, now you see this panel here relates to all the other panels on the page. And the eye is trained to go flow down into this direction. And like, no, I'm just trying to cram the pictures onto the page. I don't. <laughs> there's no artistic value to it at all. I'm just I'm trying to smash as much as I can. This panel has nothing to do with that panel, except to lead into it. And this panel has nothing to do with the rest of the page. I'm just trying to. So if you want artwork, I'm sure there's other comics that are artistic and, and have that. That every page is a, a separate work of art, but not my comics. They're just an attempt to cram as much as I can into that panel. So if you're seeing something there, that I think you're seeing something that's not really there. I think I'm seeing stuff that you don't realize that you did. But I, I'd like to think that's pretty yeah. Good. <laughs> By the way, let's go to page nine. Thank you. That's that's this page. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because obviously, when I see this, uh, you think about the full full two-page spread. No. Well, but why do you think? I think so. I think about the last panel. Yeah. I want there the last go. panel to be, a, like even Mark said, a hook mm -hmm. for the next page. There you but go. But that's the only thing on the whole page that matters. Something well, has to happen here 
that makes you say, oh, what was it? <laughs> but you must, you must be aware of the spread here because you put the very, very interesting uh, cliffhanger yeah. at the end well, of the right that. hand page. Yeah, I would not call it on a the left hand. Not on the le left hand. Well, I don't know which side of the spread it's going to be on. No? No. How would no. I know that? God damn it. You, you're destroying all my analysis here. I just because, know that's a page. Because you know, this is a right hand page. This is the last thing you see on the spread there. Yeah. And if you go to the next page, please. Okay, I've got one coming up that will be very this is, good. This is what you get when you turn the page. I didn't know you were going to turn a page. I didn't, huh? oh, I didn't know the page was being turned. I just knew I was working on one page. You're it killing might me be here. on this side, it might be on this side. How would the artists know that? Well, almost all Disney stories are start on the right, on the right not, not so always. That may I don't analyze No, they don't. No, not all always, right. no. All right. I don't analyze I'm way off anything. base here. I've got much more learned colleagues up front. But I don't analyze anything I do. I just dump it out on the page. Well, it's my job to analyze okay. this. So let's... let's anyway, you this, this, look is, this is... Okay. Hang on, I'm just going to say, all right. uh, because uh, I think this is uh, one of your best cliffhangers. The one on page right. nine leading up to this great uh, half-page oh, yeah. splash. Uh, and I also think that it's, it's brilliance in putting the, the round panel there. Yeah. Do you remember anything about yeah, why you did that? I had to do something else before I got... Maybe this should have been over here. The, the, the round panel should, should have, have been, the been last. I was thinking about that, yeah. But I had to... I needed one more panel before I got to the half page, so I squeeze it up here, and if it's round, it's like an inset. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the big panel. But it's not an official panel in itself. I got this from somewhere too. Maybe that was an Asterix book or some other. Just don't, I don't remember it from Asterix, but it could be. I remember the other panel now that now that you mentioned. But I would have, you know, I, I would have copied all of these statues from. Uh, that's what they're looking at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All of those statues from some books of National Geographic or some uh, someplace. I love the fact that you did this huge big uh, sort of room just yeah. sitting below the football yeah uh, yeah that would have, that would have <laughs> caved in that yeah it would a <laughs> long time ago <laughs> but it works it works and i think like i said i think this is this is beautiful in storytelling that right down there in that panel where he's reading cleopatra yeah oh, that says cleopatra all right i got that from a uh, i contacted an expert in hieroglyphics so that actually says cleopatra can you say something about the last panel on the left page? No. No, when you do, when you do these <laughs> yeah. focus, when you lose all the background, you put a, a circle on that. So why do you think, why do you think I do that? So to, real, uh, to, to focus on, 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 on the character. No, I'm, just, it, I'm just tired of drawing all this stuff. <laughs> there you go. That's a lot of damn work. No, seriously, background. Yeah. When I'm doing this, the, the only thing you people look at is the main characters and the expression. That's easy. It's the damn backgrounds that take 99% of the work, but you don't even look at them. Uh, but you'd notice if they weren't there. Yeah. But if I put that little circle there, you don't notice that there's no background. And I, I can just skip to the next uh, marksman who uh, silhouettes. Yeah. That was his method. But you do silhouettes as well in the, I, in the I stories. In the early stories I did, yep. because I was trying to copy marks. Mm -hmm. Later on, I stopped doing silhouettes because I like to draw the main characters and the expressions. I just, but still, I didn't want to do the backgrounds every time. Hang on, you were talking about uh, a couple of pages forward, right? Uh, this page, what number is that? Oh, hang on. That's something interesting uh, that I can talk Let, about. Let's see, let's see. Where are you? You're at uh, Yoko. You got a number? Sorry, you keep going. Did you get that? There you are. Yep. No. And back the page after. One there back. Yeah. All right, let's see. Whoa, five minutes left. We're a couple well, pages into the look story. Look at the next page, and then I'll back up. All right, so next page first. What's really... No, next. There. there you go, stop. What I've never done before is two full-page panels at the bottom. I read that. Two, 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 okay. two, Be uh, before you talk about why, could you say why you don't do two... It just doesn't look right. Or they're just full-width pages or panels, mm -hmm. I should say. It doesn't look right. Now, now you're contradicting yourself, because you said... Your page is just, you know, you cramming as much as you want into it. Now you're saying you can't do two no, I'm saying full panel. It just doesn't look right. I can't ah, explain why it doesn't look right. It's just yeah. something wrong with full, <laughs> full with panels. 
Anyway, that uh, panel with him being drugged by the dog was actually at the bottom of the page. Mm -hmm. And then the panel there where they're talking about Marco Polo. I don't remember the exact details of this problem, but Marco Polo was taking the Library of Alexandria to Venice. Uh, in the original version of the story, that panel, I think, was happening on the previous page. And the problem was I was having Marco Polo taking the Library of Alexandria to Venice 500 years before he was born. Oops. And I realized later that just not going to work. <laughs> so I had to take that panel from that page, stick it onto this page, invent another panel to fill that with. And then that meant that the, the, the top panel from over here came down here. Yeah. And I think you were actually only 50 years off, not 500. 500. To, to be fair to your story. All right. Uh, yeah. Anyway. But then if you want to go one more page. Yep. One I'll more. show you another mistake. Uh, you see up there in the, uh, well, the, the two new panels here was the tilted panel, which I, which is panel beautiful. Right below. I love that. Those were added just, I don't, I can't read that Swedish, but uh, I think they're just saying things that aren't important, but I just needed to fill two holes. The filling panels. Uh, now, in the very first panel up there, you see the dog in the bow of the, the gondola. Mm -hmm. gondola. If you notice, he might look like he's a little too small. And what happened there, and this is, I think, the only instance when somebody, the, the people at Egmont, this is over 20 years ago, so I can say things about the people at Egmont. <laughs> These are totally different people. 20 years ago, the people running Egmont Comics didn't know anything about comics. They do now. But 20 years ago, they were people who worked in accounting, who were promoted, or they were people who worked in children's literature, who were promoted thinking that you didn't, to publish comics, you didn't have to know anything about comics. They've learned that's not true. But anyway, that was the only instance when somebody at Egmont noticed I'd made a mistake. Not only that, but they corrected the mistake. <laughs> so I didn't roll that dog. I'd forgotten to put General Stasi in that boat, you know, even though he's supposed to be with him. So somebody put that little tiny miniature dog in the boat with the screw.